right, next we have Ran Rotem. Um, he sneaked into the trainee session, but he's not, he's a recent trainee, I guess. He's a research associate now uh, in the lab of Professor Mark Weisoff, where he recently completed his um, postdoctoral work at the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, and I will let him introduce his talk title. So thank you, everyone. Um, so we had a lot of discussions, great discussions today, about using animal models to infer both environmental exposures that can cause an, an outcome, and also potentially the mechanisms by which they do that. And I wanted to take a different approach, an epidemiological approach, um, on how we can try to identify both environmental exposures and potentially also the mechanisms, and specifically trying to do that using uh, electronic medical records, which I'll explain what those are. Um, in just a second. I'm going to use autism as sort of like a case in point uh, of how you can do that. So let me briefly start by just talking about what autism is. So it's a neurodevelopmental condition um, with three defining features that include impaired communication, repetitive behavior, and difficulties in social interaction. Um, sometimes we like to use autism because, first of all, as I'll uh, allude to in, in a, just one slide, um, there has been a substantial increase in the prevalence of autism in the United States and also in other countries, but also because autism is highly correlated to other uh, social and behavioral problems that children have with increasing prevalence. Um, so I mentioned that before, but these are data from the CDC, just recent data, um, released actually a few months ago suggesting that for autism, 4% of boys and 1% of girls are now diagnosed with autism in the United States, and the rate has been substantially increasing over the past two, de two decades or so. Um, and the actual rate is also, between the years, is increasing. So if you compare CDC data from 2023 to 2021, it has been a 22% increase just in the past two years, uh, using the same, basically, measurements, uh, consistent measurements from different communities. Um, these trends are not unique to the United States, so if you look at, you know, these are data from the UK where we see basically the same trend, and these are data that we published recently from Israel where we see, um, again, the same trend, and also when you look specifically, and you can see it on, the, on your right, when you look at the incidence of new cases of autism uh, based on different age groups, you can see that, you know, most cases are diagnosed between the ages of three and four, but if you compare the different birth cohorts, you can see that the rates have gone up no matter what age group you're, you're focusing on. So the etiology uh, of autism is unclear. So we know that there are some genetic risk factors, but some, and, and some people say that actually most cases are sporadic, so it's not clear what's actually causing autism. But we know that uh, there is increasing evidence for gestational or actually pre-gestational risk factors. And in part it has to do with the fact that the anatomical changes in the brain that are linked with autism are already present when the child is born. So whatever caused those changes had to operate before, before birth. So if we think about sort of like a very simple causal framework, uh, causal model, so we have you know, the environmental exposures, and those are just various different environmental exposures that I won't list right now, but they have been all associated with some brain changes. Uh, um, and then we have potentially genetic factors or something else that's also causing those effects. And you know, they can have additive or synergistic effect on making or changing some aspects of brain development um, during gestation or in the early postnatal uh, um, you know, months, uh, which eventually leads to an autism diagnosis. So if we you know, keep that causal framework in mind, and then you know, if we specifically want to then look at you know, the environmental exposures, we could do that, but that's, that's really hard to do sometimes. First of all, it's really expensive, and it's also quite complicated. We have to answer many different questions that are sometimes really hard to answer. So we have to decide whether we want to measure things by asking people what they were exposed to as opposed to actually running some measurements. We have to decide whether we are measuring things externally, for instance, by you know, looking at the concentration of a given chemical in tap water, or do we want to measure what actually enters the body? Um, we can, you know, think about questions that have to do with how, how, what's the frequency of measurements. Do we measure one time during pregnancy? Do we have to take multiple different measurements? 
Um, and also, you know, do we focus on one chemical at a time where we know that individuals are exposed to many different chemicals at the same time? So do we take a, sort of like a mixture approach or do we just focus on one chemical? All of those questions and the difficulty of answering those questions means that having exposure misclassification, basically, you know, misclassifying the exposure is actually quite common when we try to assess environmental exposures uh, directly. What we can try to potentially do instead is really focus on the biological uh, pathways that may be implicated. Um, and again, I'm looking at this from an epidemiological perspective as opposed to using animal models. And when you do that, there are several different benefits to why you might want to do that. The first one is that we have increasing availability of data. So, you know, and again, I'll talk about it in, the, in, a, in just one slide. But every time we interact with the medical system, everything is being stored and captured. So we have increasing availability of data that can tell us, tell us, us a lot about what's happening in our bodies. Um, by focusing on the biological mechanism, we can also really understand the association, biological association between whatever mechanism we're exploring and the outcome. And if we know what environmental factors actually cause changes in that uh, you know, pathway, in the biological pathway, once we understand the pathway, we can go back and think about which environmental exposures are known to affect that pathway. Um, and the last thing is that sometimes, you know, if we think about, you know, the whole sort of like causal framework, you know, even if we find that some environmental path, some environmental exposure is actually causing an outcome um, of interest, an adverse outcome, sometimes it's really hard to intervene on the environmental exposure. We just can't, you know, we can't do much with it. But if we can understand the pathway, potentially we can intervene on the pathway downstream from the environmental exposure. And if we do that effectively, we can potentially block the association between the environmental exposure and the outcome of interest. Um, right, so again, I'm gonna use autism as sort of like a case in point of how something like that may, may take place. And I'm specifically going to focus on thyroid hormones, maternal thyroid hormones, and autism in children. Um, so thyroid hormones, I won't go into the biological mechanism. It's a complicated feedback loop mechanism that involves multiple different hormones. But the bottom line is that we know they have important metabolic functions. For our sake, for the discussion we have today, they also are, are known to be very important for uh, no, no, um, you know, brain development. And specifically, the fetus is completely dependent on maternal supply of thyroid hormones during the first half of pregnancy. Um, and we know that thyroid hormones are already also highly susceptible to environmental exposures. So we have good data suggesting that you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals, air pollution, heavy metals heavily influence the concentrations of those hormones uh, in, in our bodies. So again, going back to sort of like the, the you know, causal framework that I talked about before, so we have you know, the environmental exposures, we potentially have other risk factors too, including genetic risk factors. They have additive or synergistic effects on you know, the thyroid uh, function of the mother. And then what we are trying to do here is to say, to basically explore the idea that the thyroid function in the mother has, uh, is a risk factor for autism in her children. So basically the dashed arrow that I have on the slide. And uh, you know, a follow-up question is, you know, we know that there are treatments for thyroid problems. Could we then offer mothers that have, that pro that have those problems, uh, you know, pharmaceutical treatments, and by doing so, block the pathway? So if we see an association between the maternal thyroid problem and autism, can we then medicate the mothers and block that pathway? Um, and by doing so, maybe, again, block any association between environmental exposure and, and, uh, and autism. So in order to do that, we had a cohort of 440,000 or so births. Um, and to define our exposure, basically, we kind of looked at you know, thyroid problems in two different ways. So the first way was to look at any history of uh, thyroid, uh, uh, any indication of uh, history of a thyroid problem. Um, and the other exposure there was to specifically look at hormone levels during pregnancy. Now, again, when I say any indication, that's where the EMR, the electronic, electronic medical records, become important because what we can do is to look at all lines of data we have. So that means diagnosis data from hospitals and community clinics, lab results, dispensing of medications, imaging, and any, any information that we can capture from the medical system, from the routine interactions you and I and all of us have with the medical system, we can use all of the information that comes from those interactions to really ascertain um, you know, thyroid problems. 
and we do the same thing for autism too, and I won't go into the details, but we can also do a lot of validation to make sure that we are actually capturing what we intend to capture. So and I'm skipping over a lot of the technical details and the, and the statistical analysis, uh, but these are the results, and I'm specifically showing just the results for hypothyroidism, which is having low thyroid hormone levels. That's the most common condition among uh, you know, a whole mixture of thyroid problems. Um, so the, air, the, the line that stretches across the screen, that's the no effect line. That, that would be, because we're looking at the ratio, that would be the null effect, essentially. Anything above it will be a risk factor. And, you know, the details here don't matter, but the bottom line is that no matter how we define hypothyroidism, whether it's just based on the diagnosis, whether it's based on lab results, whether it's based on dispensing of medication for hypothyroidism, whether it's based on a combination of all of those things, we saw an increased effect for autism. So basically mothers that had any history of hypothyroidism had an increased risk of having a child that had autism. So that's the first observation we had. But then again, we want to ask the question, okay, so now if we take those women and we medicate them during pregnancy, do we you know, eliminate the risk? So that's basically what we tried to look at. So on the left side of the screen, that's basically the base model, just you know, looking at women that had any history of hypothyroidism. Then you know, the middle uh, bar is basically restricting the analysis to only those women that had hypothyroidism but were continuously medicated throughout pregnancy. So we can look at the dispensing medic of medications. Every, every time they went to a pharmacy and bought the medication, we can look at that. And women that did it continuously throughout pregnancy still had, as you can see, there's no, not much of a difference. They still had an elevated risk of uh, giving birth to a child with autism. But then we can ask the question, you know, it's possible that women went, bought the medication, but for some reason adherence to actually taking the medication wasn't great. So they just didn't take it very often or missed a few times or something like that happened. So then we can further restrict the analysis to only those women that had the hypothyroidism diagnosis, bought the medications, and also had lab results during pregnancy suggesting that they were completely, you know, fine in terms of the thyroid hormone levels. And again, when we do that, we still see that the effect is there. We are not succeeding in attenuating the effect for, uh, for hypothyroidism. Then we can look at the actual hormone levels during pregnancy. If we are operating out of the assumption based on the previous results that you know, we see an association between hypothyroidism and autism, you know, the assumption would be that that association is driven by the hormone levels during pregnancy. So that's what we were trying to look at. So we had a cohort, right? It's a restricted cohort of about 50,000 uh, births uh, for whom we had actual measurements of thyroid hormones during pregnancy. And we were trying to look at the association between those continuous measurements and the risk of autism or giving birth to a child with autism. And, you know, you can see that both of those lines, so this is looking at TSH and free T4, those are the two main thyroid hormones that are usually being measured. Again, I won't go into the biological details here. But the bottom line is that, you know, we see null effects. I mean, for both of those measurements, for TSH and free, to, free T4 during pregnancy, we see that there, are no, there is no association with, uh, with autism, which is a, an intriguing finding. So if I'm summarizing everything I just told you, right, Looking at any history, any indication for a maternal thyroid problem and autism, we do see that this association exists. We see that mothers that had a history of a thyroid abnormality, specifically hypothyroidism, had an increased risk of giving birth to a child, to a child that had autism. We are also seeing that you know, when we medicate those women and make sure they're properly medicated, the effect is still there. We're not succeeding in attenuating that effect. This is despite the fact that the medications are actually doing whatever they were supposed to do. The medications are actually pretty effective at normalizing the thyroid hormone levels. So it's not like the medications don't work, they actually work fine. The issue is that there is no association between the actual hormone levels and autism. So the actual hormone levels during pregnancy do not seem to be associated with autism. So this leaves us with two possibilities. One possibility, one scenario that can cause that is that you, know, you may have an environmental exposure that causes maternal thyroid problems, but then independently of that has, is also causing autism through a different mechanism, right? So we can talk about maybe you know, inducing some sort of inflammation or other biological mechanism that links you know, that environmental exposure with autism, and because that environmental exposure is linked with autism and also causes maternal thyroid problems, we see the association between those two, between the maternal thyroid problems and autism, but the association is not causal. We only see it, statistically speaking, because there's something else upstream of both of those things that creates that association. 
The second possibility, obviously, is that you know, mothers that have a uh, hypothyroidism condition, condition also have other potential problems, like you know, they have weight issues, they have, they have other things that are happening downstream from having the hypothyroidism. So it's possible, you know, this is the question mark I have there, it's possible that something else is happening downstream from the maternal thyroid abnormality that, that is driving the association with autism. But the bottom line of all of this is that despite the initial finding, you know, we do not find an association between the thyroid hormones themselves and autism. So when we think about you know, different environmental exposures that can cause that or the mechanism by which they can do that, doing something like this using existing data before we even started measuring anything, right? before we went and, and started collecting samples and spending a lot of money, using existing data sometimes can start the process of you know, thinking more specifically about different environmental exposures that may be linked with the, with the outcome of interest and also what is the possible mechanism by which they do that. And that could be informative for how we decide later on on which environmental exposures to more carefully look at and also uh, the mechanisms that we should you know, drill into. Thank you. Hi, uh, autism is often seen as a little white boy illness, and I'm wondering if your study took any steps to mitigate the discrimination in the medical community. AFAB individuals and individuals of color are much likely to be diagnosed, much less likely to be diagnosed with autism, and I'm just wondering if you took that into consideration at all. So first of all, your point is absolutely right. In the United States, we clearly see that. So we clearly see that autism tends to be associated with SES, tends to be associated with certain races, tends to be associated with certain geographical locations. Uh, a lot of our work is actually done internationally where those issues are still there but are not as substantial, I would say. Um, and yes, as part of the statistical analysis we do, we try to control for you know, ethnicity and race and all of those different factors that you uh, mentioned. Um, you know, so your point is well taken. I think that in the United States, it's clearly an issue. I think it's less so in other countries. And I think, you know, to the extent we can, based on the data we have available, we are trying to, to uh, you know, account for all of those different reasons for why we may see this increase. I have one, just because I'm so curious. You, because of, with, of the power of this data, you can kind of extend your windows, right, into the postnatal period, like breastfeeding. Um, and then also prenatal preconception into etiologies of hypothyroidism or age of diagnosis. Have you done that to see if it could still be the hypothyroidism, but it's the type of hypothyroidism or some other postnatal factor? Right. So there is a very strong association between hypothyroidism in children that have autism. So basically, you know, looking at children's children with autism themselves, we see a strong association between the child, uh, the, you know, diagnosis of autism and and hypothyroidism in the same child. Um, so we control for that. So basically when we look at hypothyroidism, because hypothyroidism in children is also associated with hypothyroidism in their mothers. So we control for that. Basically we try to isolate the maternal effect from uh, just an association, a cross-sectional association among children themselves. Um, we are gradually expanding, you know, the more children that are born, we can look at like, you know, transgenerational effects. We can look at, you know, some of the stuff Mark mentioned this morning. Um, so. Um, so yeah, so we are gradually expanding the, the scope of this project and also looking at you know, different mechanisms, different potential environmental exposures. Um, I think again, the main benefit of doing it with EMR data, the electronic, uh, electronic medical data, is that the data is readily available. So you don't have to spend a lot of resources collecting it um, and that's a good starting point for you know, a lot of the more intricate studies that have been discussed earlier today. <laughs> 